Welcome back to Stories from the Stead with your host, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest and head alchemist at Bird's Eye Indiana's own Old Homestead Distillery. Today we are recording part two of our Bex Mill story from a newspaper article, a set of newspaper articles written in 1922 called Snapshot of the Old Bex Rock House, Mill and Surroundings. As I mentioned in the previous video, Bex Mill is a very special place to me and to my tribe of heathens, as it were. Heathen distillers, in fact. Uh, we like to get together out there, we like to do reenactments, but we also like to get together and just to have a good time. Sometimes we're not even reenacting, sometimes we do a little talk about history, and then we try to get together with other local distillers, other local moonshiners or home distillers, and just have a little uh, fun get together, a little talk about some of the local history. Sometimes we get together and we'll actually make a stone beer or a grut for distillation uh, from whatever is local and growing on the hill at that time, foraging what we can. It is a very special place. It is a sacred place to me. I cannot stress that enough. The crossroads there are the most powerful crossroads in the county of Washington that I know of. There's a very special energy in that place for multiple reasons. This article, as you may have noticed in the in the previous edition, is touching on some of those things without giving you all the information. And the truth of the matter is, even the information that I have that goes beyond this article, is sworn to secrecy. I'm not allowed to tell you. As such, I never will. I pick a handful of people to tell the facts that I know of Bex Mill and other sacred places around Washington County so that they can carry it on to the next generation, but never to be advertised to the public. So in many ways, this is sacred knowledge that you're getting from this 100-plus-year-old newspaper. I hope you enjoy. We're going to go back to our second part of the first article. A Bear Hunter's Tragedy. All history and tradition tells us that in 1800 to 1812, this part of the county was the habitat of the wolf, bear, wild hog, panther, and Indian. Somewhere about these dates, a famous bear hunter of Arkansas came to the Becks for a hunt. He and one of George Beck's cut sons, the oldest, if I am informed, went out one winter day to hunt for bear. Snow was deep on the ground. Both were equipped with gun and ammunition. Of course, the bear dog was along, as it required this canine to bay the bear and panther. They chanced to come inside of the bear trail. Signs indicated that in the snow that their game was near, and a large one. They moved on with eagerness with a rifle, well charged. About sunset, they had tracked their game into the cave. Now, what to do and how to do it was a question to be his bear ship. To venture into the cave after him meant great danger, if not sudden death. The old Arkansas hunter backed square out and would not venture into the cave. Beck was rather of a daring disposition and said to his friend that he would get a long pole and put a torch on the end of it and go in after Mr. Bear if he, Arkansas, would remain at the mouth of the cave. So all preparation was made. Beck, with his trusty rifle, pole, and light went alone. He kept his light 15 feet in front of him with his rifle in hand. Finally, he came to a point in the cave where he had to crawl Finally, looking forward with eager eyes, he saw the bright shining eye of the bear. He paused, looked, and thought. Now should he shoot and cripple Brune? He would pounce up on him and eat him up before he could back out. He concluded he would run his pole and light up as close as he dared to the bear, command his attention, then shoot. This he did. The crack of the trusty rifle, his bear ship rolled over and began to grow. Beck backed out, reached the mouth of the cave, where the Arkansas was. The hunter asked him, asked the bold and daring hunter, the result, and he was informed. They stood at the mouth of the cave until the groan of the bear ceased. Then they went into the cave after him, fastened the hook to his nose, and dragged him out of the cave. The reader, no doubt, will be surprised when he is told that this brood weighed 400 pounds. We will say, for the benefit of the reader, that we were not born yet and cannot vouch for all the facts of the bear hunt. Do know that later years bears were kept on the noted hill, for we saw them. At one time, John Mitchell, who lived on across Mill Creek from Bex, killed hogs and had eleven large hogs hanging on the pole. And Mr. Brune, which was kept in a log pen, smelt the blood and fresh pork, raised the roof off of his den, and deliberately walked over to see what was going on. John supposing the purpose of his visit 
gave the heart of the hog at once. Mr. Bear climbed up the walnut tree, which still stands to first limb. There he stretched himself happily and ate his supper of heart. His appetite and curiosity being satisfied, he came down and one of the becks came with his chain and led him home. He was very large and inoffensive, except when he made mad. This Mr. Bear was kept tied to the large white oak tree in the yard, where he would move in a semicircle and amuse the people who came that way. The Stone House. George Beck Sr. built this stone house in the year 1811, which now stands, but not, but now not habited. Up until the last few years, some of the Becks lived in it. Andrew Beck lived across the creek where this narrator was reared. John Mitchell bought the land and home of Andrew Beck. John Beck lived on Blue River at what was known as James Rudder Mill. John Beck constructed a dam across Blue River and built a grist mill. Afterwards, a sawmill was constructed on the opposite side of the river where much lumber was manufactured. George Beck Sr. lived on the hill in the rock house until his death. He was a man straight as an arrow, broad shoulders, and about six feet tall. He was an illiterate man, that is, he could neither read nor write, as I have been informed. Yet he was a man of good common sense and good judgment. He was always a Jeffersonian Democrat, a good citizen. He did not make any attempt towards religion. Yet when Samuel Trueblood and William Pinkham came to the mill place to hold services, he was there to hear them preach. His friends came once or twice a year to hold services at this place for several years. He and his wife Betsy had three boys, David, George, and John A. Beck, and several girls. John A. is still alive and has passed 81 years. Betsy died several years before her husband. George Sr. lived to be quite an old man. David Beck owned the Beck's mill for several years before he died. Dangerous, dangerous and desperate men and characters. William Donathan was a son-in-law of George Beck, Sr. He kept the saloon on the hill for many years and was one of the proprietors of one of the distilleries. It was during this period that the hill became known as Hell's Half Acre. Donathan himself was a gambler and the hill was infested with many bad and questionable characters. Some of them went under their own names, such as Stroud, Pitts, Maxwell, Jim and Ira Richardson, Wesley Jones. Others went under such non de plume as Buster, Wild Jack, Illinois Sharper, and Bee Gum. During these years of debauch, many citizens thought it not safe to pass over the hill after night. As stated above, this place during this period of debauch and drunkenness was known far and wide as Hell's Half Acre. It can be said to the honor of all, the Becks, that they did not give tone or encourage such outrageous conduct as was made manifest by these bad characters. I will give a few incidents which may give a hint of what took place in part. Thomas Green then lived at the John Beck place on Blue River. He owned and operated the grist and sawmills. He at some time gave offense to some of these desperate characters, especially to Wes Jones. The insult was only fancied, but it was sufficient. Two of these desperate characters, Maxwell and Jim Richardson, were employed to burn Green's mill by Jones. These two men, loaded with booze, went to execute the job, but they failed in the attempt by a watchman on guard. Again, they went, and when near the mill, this watchman was couched behind a large red oak tree and heard the conversation. Maxwell said to Richardson, What harm has Tommy Green done to us? Richardson answered, He is a good man. He never did me any harm. And at that, they turned back and determined that they would not burn his property. They said, Let him that is offended do the burning. The saying of Shakespeare was fully demonstrated in this, Our conscience doth make cowards of us all. Another incident. Some of these parties threatened to burn John Mitchell's house. The date was set, and a friend of Mitchell's heard the arrangement and informed him. His three boys, Hiram, Samuel, and James, were armed and placed at a convenient places to guard the property. Maxwell and Richardson came at the appointed time but passed by, then came back but did not turn in. Two or three nights after this... The time was set again. The same parties came by road and then came back and passed up to the yard gate. Richardson's coat fell to the ground and at this moment he was covered with a revolver, shotgun, and an axe. He begged while Maxwell moved off as fast as his horse could run. Jim said if we would let him go, they never would bother us again. They kept their words, for we were never disturbed again. It was the custom at that day to swap work and harvest. John Mitchell. Williams, Hiram, and Sam 
His sons were helping George Beck Jr. to harvest his hay. In the evening late, we were all in the yard at Beck's and Jim Richardson was trying to raise a fuss with Will and John Mitchell, said to Frank Hiram, let me have your black snake whip and I will settle with these boys. Just at this moment, Ira Richardson came out and said, John, you can't whip my boy and attempted to strike John. Just at this moment, John struck Ira in the butt of the ear and turned his heels in the air, then punched him a few times in the short ribs and Ira cried, enough, by S.H. Mitchell. That concludes the second part of the first article. I hope you guys greatly enjoyed that and the inferences that were also made about further information that is not public knowledge within this article. We'll be back tomorrow with the second part of the article. From our hearts and hearts to yours. Later.